1967, Amicus released The Deadly Bees, but did I find it to be a gorgeously sweet helping of cinematic honey or a film I just hoped would buzz off? Hi guys, so before we get into it, the usual disclaimer that you'll find all my other reviews of films made by Amicus in my Amicus playlist, and there will be some spoilers today, but I will stop myself from telling you who the secret villain is behind all the bee attacks, because you don't find that out until very late in the day. So this was the third film that I've seen in my life about killer bees. The other two... One of them was the 1977 film The Swarm, a much bigger budget film, albeit one that's often been derided. It doesn't have a great reputation. A, f a friend of mine at uni introduced me to it 20 years ago, and it, it, I, I actually really enjoyed it in a so bad it's good way. It's got Michael Caine in it. I actually think of it as Michael Caine's The Swarm. <laughs> I don't think of it as The Swarm. The other film that I saw about bees uh, was a more recent effort from 2020. Funnily enough, though, it, another film called The Swarm. It's not a remake of the 77 Swarm. It just happens to have the same title. French film. I saw it on Netflix. I don't think it's still on Netflix, but I would encourage you to hunt this film down any way that you can because it's probably the best of the three films that I've seen about bees. Now, bees are actually a creature that I don't mind seeing in films and now when it comes to other like really small animals creepy creepy crawlies and things like that i just can't watch them i, I don't like films about spiders or worms or snakes they're little things that can just get in your clothes i i, I just don't like that kind of stuff but I'll, I'll make an exception for bees and i don't really know why bees just don't really get under my skin in the same way that other really small animals do. Now this film, once you get past a slightly dodgy setup, has a, a reasonable mystery behind it and some decent horror actually, but, but the setup's just odd. This was a film written I think by Robert Block, but he ended up disowning it once he realised what they'd done in the rewrites and things. I don't think he even watched the film in the end which is a little bit harsh I mean at least watch the thing but whatever but yeah the setup is just odd so we've got a pop star played by Susanna Lee she has a breakdown on the mainland of the UK and she gets sent to this small island called Seagull Island to convalesce and now the only people who live on this island are beekeepers and their nearest and dearest and the pop star is basically uh, using one of these bee farms as a kind of hotel to make herself feel better. But once she's there, people start to die from mysterious bee attacks and nobody knows who it is who's controlling the bees and suddenly everybody's life on the island is in grave danger. Quite a few actors in this who I recognise. So the pop star, for instance, played by Susanna Lee, she would go on to be in Hammer Films, The Lost Continent and Lust for a Vampire. I can't say that I recognised her from either of those films, even though I saw both of them in, in the last few years. I mean, something like Lust for a Vampire, there's so many gorgeous women in that film. Even somebody like Susanna Lee could easily get lost in the shuffle. There's also an actor called Guy Dolman in this film, not somebody I would suggest is particularly famous, but as a James Bond fan, I instantly recognised him as one of the minor villains from Thunderball. That came out in 1965, and I would say that Dolman looked, uh, looks rather bored in The Deadly Bees, and I can understand it. He's basically gone from being in a James Bond film to being in a cheap little film about killer bees, so it's probably quite the come down albeit he wasn't one of the, the main villains in Thunderball we've also got Katie Wilde in this film if you've seen lots of Hammer and Amicus films you might have seen Katie Wilde pop up a few times she she always she's always like the, the, the second most glamorous woman in any film that she's in she she doesn't usually have a, a, a huge role but she's she was in quite a few things in the 60s and 70s, albeit I, I, I don't think she's a particularly amazing actress, but she's somebody I instantly recognise without having to see her name on the credits. I'll throw one more name at you, apart from director Freddie Francis, back to direct once again. All the films I've done so far by Amicus on this channel all been directed by Freddie Francis, but that last actor name I'm going to chuck out there the great Michael Ripper, who uh, the longest serving Hammer actor ever, and he shows his face in this film playing a barman. How many times has Ripper played a barman? 
I actually stopped to consider for the briefest of moments during this film whether they might have made Michael Ripper the secret villain who was going to turn out to be the mastermind behind the whole thing. And then I instantly chastised myself because as if they were going to have Ripper suddenly pop up explaining his evil plan at the end of the film. Just unfathomable. And quite rightly, they didn't go down that avenue. Ripper is just a straight down the line barman as he always should be. Having a pop star as the main character is something of a double-edged sword. On the positive side, it leads to some pretty decent music. This film opens up with a couple of great little pop numbers that sound like they've come straight out of a 1967 episode of Top of the Pops. Was that show even on back then? I don't know. I was born in 1980. But I really liked these songs, and one of them plays on the menu of, of the Blu-ray. And once this film was over, I just sat and let it play on loop for like 10 minutes. I was enjoying it that much. But on the flip side, uh, no matter how many times I try and spin it in my head, it, it really doesn't make sense to have a pop star being the main character who goes to Bee Island. I think they really should have just made it like a, a distant niece of the main beekeeper or something like that. If I try and picture a real world pop star in this same situation, it's it's not very easy. So I guess the first female pop star that would come into my head if I tried to think of one, even though I'm not into music one bit, would be Taylor Swift. Very, very famous person. But if I try and put her into the shoes of Vicky, the main character from this, it's not easy to do. I mean, what were... What, what we're asking ourselves to picture here is, is the notion that Taylor Swift, after a, a random breakdown, would be sent to a small island off the coast of America and then in the dead of night she'd be running around with a camera trying to take pictures of bee formula in the hopes of catching a, a supervillain out. It's hard to imagine, and not just because it's I'm, I'm putting Taylor Swift into this scenario. It could be Katy Perry, Lily Allen, Dido, anybody who is a pop star... It, it just doesn't work in this situation. But hey-ho, the bee attacks in this were something that I was worried would look very bad. I mean, my memories of the 1977 uh, Michael Caine's The Swarm, I remember the effects in that film being absolute shite. So uh, for a film made 10 years before that, i.e. this, I thought they would be even worse. And actually, the first kill in this is quite dreadful. But... I was quite amazed, actually. Once you get past the first kill in this, all the action scenes are much better after that. The effects seem better and the choreography seems better. It's like that... It's as if the director and the people who financed this film looked at the rushes of the first kill and thought, oh, God, we've got to do better for the rest of this or this film is going to sink. And they have put a, a really great effort in after that because there's, there's some really great stuff in this film, like, you know, characters running from room to room and shutting doors on the bees and bees getting in under the doorway and people using fire to ward off the bees and the, the moments of high tension. There's a massive fire that breaks out in the, in the finale of the film and that's really exciting. There's a character running through the woods and bees are chasing and there's all sorts of good stuff once you get past the first kill, which is really bad to watch. So we've got this woman, she comes outside of this farmhouse and there's bees everywhere and this is really odd because the bees should be in the hive. She knows this, but she stands there gawping like, huh? Uh huh? for like half an hour, and then the bees predictably swarm her, and then she, st she just starts going... And obviously there's no actual bees there. The, the director's just told her, told her to like you know swing her arms around as fast as she can, and the bees will be superimposed onto the top of her later on. But the effect of it just looks awful. And the fact that she's not trying to run or do anything, it just makes the whole scene just terrible to watch. And at this point in the movie, I thought, oh, God got an hour more of this but like i said earlier it to my surprise everything beyond this scene is is a hell of a lot better now hands in the air i did not at all guess who the villain was in this we are presented with a number of possible suspects and we've got to try and figure out if we can who is the dastardly person letting the bees out of the hive but I absolutely uh, w was way off in terms of my guess. So credit to the movie for successfully duping me in a perfectly believable and reasonable way because I was more than satisfied with uh, who the villain turns out to be. O other people will probably guess it correctly. Whether that makes the film less effective for them as, as a viewing experience, I, I 
I cannot say. I actually considered at one point whether the villain might be somebody we'd not yet seen. I, I thought the film might be pulling a, a Pamela Voorhees type thing where you don't get to see who the killer is until they actually turn up, which a, a lot of people think is quite unfair when, when a movie does that, but that's not what happens here. The villain is very much in plain sight all along. The characters are very hit and miss. I, I really like Michael Ripper. I, I like... Uh, Susanna Lee's portrayal as Vicky. Susanna Lee is really taking this very, very seriously, and she puts in a very, very credible performance, I think. She's very good. I can't say whether she is or isn't singing her song or whether she's being dubbed. I, I suspect she's not actually doing the singing, but her acting performance in the rest of the movie is top notch. There are some really dreary characters elsewhere in the movie, though. Um, the main beekeeper, played by Guy Dolman, he is an absolute bore. His wife is even worse. Uh, the other beekeeper on the island looks more like a maths teacher than a beekeeper. It's a strange bit of casting. I, th I think originally Boris Karloff and Christopher Lee were down to play the roles of the main beekeepers, but they couldn't get Karloff and Lee. They've ended up having to go onto the B list. And yeah, yeah these replacement actors, I, I guess they're okay, but the film could have done with a Cushing or a Lee just to make it even more enjoyable for us longer time, uh, us long time fans of Hammer and, and Amicus, you know. Um, the film on the whole, it's, it's quite entertaining. It, it is the worst of the three killer bee movies i've seen and there are some other issues that i've not even gone into i mean the island it's just kind of pointless to me i don't understand why this film is set on an island and and why the hell is it called seagull island just call it bee island or wasp island um the entire thing is set in a little farmhouse with a bit of woodland nearby we never see the beach or the sea so it just makes the placement of this film on an island rather odd you could have just had it in the middle of the countryside on the mainland and that would have been fine and there's also a strange little subplot where the villain is communicating with the british government threatening them with releasing this new strand of bees for what purpose i don't know but this sub threat just kind of goes nowhere like the rest of the movie is just this self-contained thing on a farmhouse with like six or seven characters so why the home office had to be contacted in some of the early scenes only for that whole side of things to go pretty much nowhere uh it's pretty bizarre to say the least but i i did like it i've got to say mainly because i just like old movies in general it's a pretty good b movie oh i <laughs> see what i did there So we've reached that point where I'll show you the version of the film that I own for this. Here is my Blu-ray copy of The Deadly Bees. Now, I love the artwork for this. I love the fact that it's yellow. And I like the fact that on the back, the pictures are all in hexagon shapes. Is that the right word for a six-sided shape? It's been a long time since I did maths at school. But I like the box for this. Sadly, though, no features on the disc. It's got a brilliant uh, menu screen with music playing on a loop, but no features really um, to speak of. But the picture quality, audio, uh, all that stuff is really good. Um, 13 pounds, I think I paid for it. Is it worth it? Just depends how much money you've got in your pocket, I suppose. Although if you hunt around a bit, you might be able to find it somewhere to rent if you, if you don't want to shell out for the Blu-ray. Right, it's time to get to the Bag of Terror and it's time to find out what sort of score I'm going to give this one. So we got one, two, three, three and a half bloody axes out of five. A decent movie. I did kind of enjoy the cheesiness of it. Uh, and there we go. Our Amicus series continues to prosper. The next one I'm going to cover is a film called The Terranauts. It's sort of half sci-fi half horror i've never seen it i don't actually know anything about it but i've already ordered it so we'll see what happens with that one until next time cheerio bye bye